so if you could just tell me your full name and a little bit of background and then we'll carry on from there. I'm James Boyle. I teach at Duke University in North Carolina. I'm in the United States. And how have you found the conference so far? It's been excellent. Um, actually, I would say inspiring. There are a lot of people here who really care about digital civil liberties. Um, you've got people who are focused on privacy, on free speech, um, on access to cultural heritage. Uh, and I really see people who are actually very focused on making a difference in a positive way, not just criticizing everything, but actually saying, how can we make legislation better? How can we come up with private schemes that make things better? Um, so it's not a shrill conference, but I think it's a very constructive conference. I mean, this is the first ever conference that they've held. So what is the significance, do you think, in terms of the future and impacting the public? Britain has this amazing tradition of a very rich civil society that comes together and improves government policy. You need a, an organized civil society base to improve government policy. In any area of government regulation, you're going to have a lot of citizens who individually have a small stake but collectively have a huge stake in what's going on, and you're going to have a few interests who have a concentrated interest, who are repeat players, who are very well represented. If you don't want to get the kind of bad legislation that pretty much inevitably results from that with no ill will on anyone's part and no ill will on the part of the representatives, you have to have organizations that come in and supply expertise, that supply knowledge, that translate issues into, like, how does this matter to my life? OrgCon, in my view, is the most important first step in building the digital civil society movement in Britain to provide exactly that. Because there are a lot of people who are heard now in the debates, and they should be heard. The recording industry, the movie industry, computer software, they have perfectly legitimate points of view. They should be heard. But there is also a point of view for citizens, for small businesses, for artists who want to reuse things. Who's going to supply those people with the expertise, with the access, with the collective weight that the other side has pretty much naturally? And that's what OrgCon, I think, could provide. So you're talking, or you've just been talking about the impact on big industries. Now, obviously, the internet is not just for the big industries, it's for everyday members of the public. What would you say, I mean, it's not an issue that's become widely publicized. What would you say to, you know, the average Joe blogs walking down the street who uses Facebook, who uses Twitter? Does this really affect them? I think it affects every facet of their life. They use, we use the internet as a search tool. Do you want to get accurate search results or do you want to get only the search results your internet service provider wants you to see? Do you want to be able to connect to your preferred provider or do you want only to get a few chosen uh, uh, portals? Do you want privacy online? Um, or do you want regulatory schemes or commercial schemes which strip your data and combine it in ways that could be profoundly hurtful? Do you want you and your kids to have access to your culture, to your cultural heritage, to your great libraries, to your great archives? Or do you want those things to be locked up by default by copyright? Do you want free speech online? Do you want to be able to debate? Do you want to be able to talk to your MPs? Do you be able to want to express opinions, even intemperate opinions? Or do you want to be subject to swinging libel laws, which basically take guilt as assumed, uh, violating the Anglo-American idea of the presumption of innocence? Each one of those is basically important to stuff you do every day. This isn't arcane, this isn't intellectual, this is basic. It's like the roads and the pavements and the water. The internet is now like that in our lives. And just as we can't leave the roads or the pavement or the water to be run entirely by private interests, we can't leave the internet to be. Now, the Digital Rights, uh, the Digital Economy Act has just been passed. What is that? Explain it to somebody who's not very familiar with this. Well. I'm not as expert on the Digital Economy Act as many of the people who worked on it in this country. But from my point of view, the Digital Economy Act is stage two of a set of regulations of the internet. Stage one was a set of regulations which said that people who have content, copyrighted content, can wrap digital fences around it and can prevent you and indeed legally go after you if you get through that digital fence, even if what you're doing when you get to the other side is perfectly legal, if you're making a fair use or fair dealing, you're quoting, you're parodying, whatever, um, they are saying, no, you're not allowed to get access to our content. And that was the first stage uh, marked in Europe by the European Copyright Directive. The Digital Economy Act has many, many components, and I can't address them all, but one of the components is really a stage two. And the stage two is the desire by 
content owners to increase their level of uh, control by basically privatizing the system of enforcement, allowing them to initiate a process to cut off somebody's internet connection based on their claim that they have done something naughty three times online, which might be right or might be wrong. It might be them, might be somebody else who used their connection. And this idea of privatizing justice, which we know from the feudal system, we know from the Middle Ages, where we basically turn over to private parties the right to invoke the power of the state. This is something not to be done lightly. And in my view, the Digital Economy Act set the balance in the wrong place. Content providers have very legitimate reasons to want to protect their content, but their interests are not the only interests. And the getting access to the internet, as lots of people have pointed out, is just a fundamental part of a citizen's daily life as getting access to the roads. Could you imagine someone saying, well, I think that you drive unsafely, so I think you shouldn't be able to use the roads, and I can stop you from, I can take away your car, and then you have to somehow sue to get it back. People are going, no, no, that, that, we don't do that, right? There, there's a legal process, and if I violated the law, by all means, let me be hauled into court and let me, my license be taken away. But let's not privatize the process of enforcement. So I think this is a mark, this is something where I think a lot of the MPs were not terribly well informed. They believed legitimately that they were doing something that was important to maintain Britain's competitiveness. But I don't think that the balance was struck in the right place and I'd like to see some of the significant dissenting voices who were raised at the time come back and say, no, we need to actually fix this and make it better and put in more balance, more procedural protections and make sure this is something that's actually fair to the citizens involved. So in your opinion, what can we do to change this? Well, I think the first thing is that a lot of MPs think that this is something that citizens just don't care about. So MPs are rational. They respond to their perceptions of what their constituents care about. And digital economy sounds kind of arcane and wonkish and, you know, who really cares about that? And if someone says, hey, you know what? Um, some kid driving by got access to your Wi-Fi connection and downloaded something and now your kid can't um, file their application for university because your internet's being cut off, you're not getting your email, you've got to go through some process, you don't even know who to talk to, that person's going to say, wait a minute, that's not... What, what about British procedural justice? What about the idea of innocent until proven guilty? And I think people will be quite shocked by some of these changes. I actually think if that's explained to MPs in simple language, one or two syllable words, hopefully uh, polite ones, then I think their views might change. So this issue hasn't really been publicised in the mainstream media. It's been glossed over maybe by, you know, certain channels or certain publications. Why do you think that media don't really focus on this aspect unless it's, you know, a specialist publication? I think, um, I think that's true, although I think it's changing. So even looking from outside the UK, I noticed that The Guardian and The Independent had very thoughtful articles on this, that it did receive coverage in places like The Economist and so forth. But I do think that there's still a perception that this is an arcane, wonkish issue. It's sort of like changing the laws of you know, estates and trusts and how you make a will. Like, that's not something that, you, you know, if you're a journalist, it's like, I don't want to put that in the press. Then when someone says, no, this is actually a free speech issue, it's a privacy issue, it's a citizen participation in government issue, then you start saying, oh, well, actually, we should be covering that. That, actually, is something that organizations like the Open Rights Group can really do, because they can help make comprehensible to journalists these ideas and say, no, this isn't some set of acronyms, and we are all prone, when we talk about stuff we know a lot about, to use insider terms and use specialized language and jargon, and the public, quite rightly, immediately glazes over and what we have to do is instead say, do you want to be cut off from the outside world? <laughs> it's a very simple point. Um, and what do you think should need to be done in order for that to happen? And the interesting thing is, I think most people would say, well, I actually don't think it's okay for someone to just sit there and download everybody else's music. It's not like they're saying, I want freedom to do anything. I want digital anarchy. What they are saying is, well, aren't there more players involved than just the record industry or the movie industry? And the answer is yes, there are. You wrote a book recently, The Public Domain, Enclosing the Commons of the Mind. Um, and it was all about how it's important for people to know about free material and how to use that. Can you explain whether this is actually relevant to people who are not interested in the digital world? I mean, we all use the internet, but why should you know someone be into, why is this important to everyday life? Um, everyday life is the public domain. 
you and I are speaking English. It's not English 1.0, for which we require a license. It's not English 2.0, which has digital rights management uh, wrapped around it. It's not English where you or I are forbidden from creating a new word or making up a joke. Uh, or uh, producing some new phrase, we can do that because it is an open source system. It's a system that we can build on. We exist in a world of ideas, uh, a world of culture, a world of science, where most of the significant material that we take and build upon in our everyday lives, whatever we do, is actually in the public domain. We use the public domain every day, all the time, to communicate, to create. The question then is, what stuff should be in the public domain? And if I tell you, oh, someone just came up with the idea of patenting business methods so that there are patents over quite fundamental things that you could do online, or the idea of setting up some kind of used car uh, uh, dealership, or the idea of uh, selling uh, particular financial services online, or if I tell you that a gene can be actually patented, or if I tell you that there are copyrights over quite uh, fundamental uh, notions uh, or quite uh, fundamental pieces of culture that you can't use and that they last an insanely long period of time, then I think you start to say, oh, well, now I get it. What you're saying is the stuff that I use to do my job, to build my culture, to tell my stories, to make my jokes, to build my music, that stuff can be free and open or it can be covered by intellectual property. Some of it needs to be covered by intellectual property, but not all of it. And I need to find what the balance is. And that has nothing to do with the internet. It has to do with laughing, living, speaking, playing, creating, telling stories. What inspired the book? I'd been working for about 10 years trying to tell people that intellectual property was not an arcane subject but something that they should care about. And I found that all of the focus was on the stuff that was protected. Everything's intellectual property. There are hundreds, thousands of intellectual property centers around the world. There was until we created one. No center on the public domain. The analogy that I used is to the environment. We used to just talk about development, 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 industrial development. And no one said, well, actually, do we need an environment that continues to exist, like oxygen that we can breathe, you know, water that we can drink, ecosystem services that function in order to sustain this development? And then we thought, oh, yeah, it needs to be sustainable development. We had that realization in the world of the environment. We have not had that realization in the world of intellectual property. So I wanted to write my own little silent spring, my own little book about what the environmental side of the public domain was, what it provided to our worlds of creativity and culture. And lastly, I mean, you've achieved a lot in your career and, you know, crossed a lot of barriers to, to be where you are today. What would you say to painters or activists who are just starting out and, and fairly new to the field, but, you know, want to make a difference? What would be your message to them? I envy them. Um, I would say that on the one hand, you can look at this and say there are all these barriers to getting access, that the legislative processes seem in, intractable, that you can't, you know, even you have great arguments, you can't get heard. On the other hand, the technology that we're talking about is the single most powerful technology of speech that we have ever invented. In the United States, they used to say, freedom of the press belongs to those who have one. Now we all have one. And that's an inspiring thought. Great, thank you very much.